reflect that <coughs> impedance through our linear transformer back into the primary loop. So now we are going to move to the ideal transformer. Because most of the time, just like we talked about um, with like op amps, doing the ideal version is a lot easier to calculate. And most of the time, it's a pretty decent approximation to real life. It's not perfect, but it gets us pretty close. So the ideal transformer is a unity coupled, meaning k is 1. That coupling coefficient, k is 1. It's lossless. So we assume, again, lots of assumptions, that there is no resistance in any of the coils. There's a big coil of wire, but there shouldn't. we don't account for any of that resistance. And the primary and secondary coils have infinite self-inductance. So the value of the inductor for the first and the second coil is assumed to be near infinity, meaning that it has, if, if you remember back to chapter six, the inductance of a coil of wire is based on the number of loops that the coil makes. As the number of loops goes up, the inductance goes up. So what that basically assumes is that the number of windings on the primary and the number of windings on the secondary are both very high, like hundreds or thousands of loops. That's what you're going to really be investigating during your lab. When you work on your project for transformer design, you're really going to be looking at, OK, how many loops does it take Kind of like how many links does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop, right? The world may never know, but you will know how many loops it takes on a transformer to get close to the ideal case, right? So, and, you know, if you do a really good job, maybe I'll bring you a Tootsie Pop. But <laughs> the ideal transformer does rely on having a lot of turns. That's why transformers are heavy. They're big, bulky things most of the time because you just have a lot of wire, and metal weighs a lot. So here's a simplified diagram. We've talked about this a couple of times, and I mentioned that the real, you know, the nice transformers that you buy are typically wound around a nice, you know, iron core that enhances the magnetic field effect. Oftentimes they're enclosed, and so there's sort of a, a, a double loop thing like this, and the two wires are often wound around the same central core. In this case, where you, you know, this is depicting more of what our circuit diagram, our schematic looks like. There are two coils share a core. So we assume all the magnetic field from N1 passes through this core and into N2. That's what this is showing or assuming. We draw the transformer diagram like this, the this, this schematic symbol, and it is two inductors. They're mutually coupled, so we do need to show the dots. And we draw this double line representing the core in the middle, and that tells us that this is an ideal transformer. The ideal transformer allows us to simplify the way we work with transformers by only looking at the turns ratio. So we have a whole bunch of turns, but having 100 turns in one, which may be close enough to an infinite self-inductance, but 300 turns in the other, which is also close to an infinite self-inductance, the fact that there's a 3 to 1 turns ratio changes the voltage that one sees relative to the other. So take this in the simple case. I have a loop of wire. It generates a magnetic field. I put one other loop of wire on top of it, very close in contact. The same magnetic field flows through it. Therefore, the same current will flow in that wire. Right? If I put more than one loop, <clears throat> so if in my primary side, I have a single loop, And in my secondary side, I put two loops. The magnetic field flowing through here generates a current, right? But it's going to generate now current in two loops on the top. So our turns ratio <laughs> allows us to go from a high voltage and low current to a low voltage and high current in our secondary. Right? So we can trade off voltage for current. And that multiplication happens, or you know, that adjustment happens by that ratio of turns because of this. So 
in this case, we can see on our schematic of our inductor of our transformer now over here, if I want to know the ratio of the voltage in the secondary to the voltage in the primary, right? So that's being applied by a voltage supply in this case. So that's like the wall socket, right? The voltage in the secondary divided by the voltage in the primary, so how much bigger is it, right? Is equivalent to the number of turns in the secondary over the number of turns in the primary. So the big N2 over big N1, we define as the turns ratio, little n. So we will often describe and a transformer as a one to something, one to n transformer. So if it's a one to three, that means that there's going to be three times more windings. In this case, this is a one to two transformer, right? One winding in the primary, big N1. Two windings in the secondary, big N2. Right? So N1 equals one, N2 equals two, and that gives me a one to two winding. So I would know that my voltage in the secondary, right, is going to be twice as high as the voltage in the primary. Of course, we have to trade off. Power is the same. We're assuming <coughs> unity coupling. So all the power that flows into this, right, is going to very nicely generate power in the secondary. So if I'm increasing voltage, I decrease current by that same ratio. So the current in the secondary is going to be half of the current in the primary. That's a step up transform. So if, we, if the voltage in the secondary is higher than the voltage in the primary, we call it a step up. If the voltage in the secondary is lower than the voltage in the primary, we call it a step down. And we use both, and they go both ways. So most transformers, of course, if I were to switch the roles of V and ZL, and I put this voltage supply on the right-hand side, it's going to take that voltage, and if the number of windings are twice as high here than here, it's going to step that voltage down. So this end over here ends up with a smaller voltage, but a higher current. And that's what the power company does. That's what those transformers on the poles do. We said we want to use very small currents to transfer our power, because that allows us to use much smaller wires. So it costs less to run the wire, right? So the transformer allows us to take the total amount of power, I times V, that we want. It allows us to increase V and reduce I. And when I is small, we can flow through very small wires. So that's why the big, long distance power transmission wires, we don't see very many of them here in Connecticut. Some areas, when you get up into the northern parts, you'll see those really tall, massive power lines. Those will run at you know, hundreds of thousands of volts, 450,000 volts or more. And it's so that they're carrying a fraction of an amp of current, or, or a couple of amps of current at the most. So they can use much, much smaller wires. But then you go through a transformer to step that voltage down, because 40, you know, 400,000 volts, that's not a good thing to have just lying around your house, right? You don't want to plug that in because that could prob probably arc across like two feet of free space, right? So every time you go to plug your vacuum cleaner in, you know, you're going to have to stand back with a big plastic pole that's like five feet long. I mentioned to some of you my, my advisor when I was in college, right? Um, I don't remember if I said it in class, but he had a we had a power transformer on a piece of equipment that we used, and he had built it during his graduate studies and brought it to my university. So I worked on it with, for, I worked on that equipment with him a little bit, and it was an electron gun, much like what's in our scanning electron microscope in here. It generates a very high voltage, 10 to 20,000 volts, so that you can you know, rip electrons free and accelerate them very, very quickly at a surface. And we did that to map out the location of atoms on the surface of a, of a crystal. But that really high voltage has to come from power supply. And so he had a power supply that would take line voltage and it would tr have a big transformer and it would crank that up to 10,000 or 15,000 volts. And he said, you know, I, I asked him one day, I said, why is there this big sheet of plexiglass sticking like four inches in front of that control panel and why do you have big rubber stoppers on all of the knobs and switches. He said, after the third time I got blown across the room, 
I decided I wasn't going to touch that box anymore. Right? So something inside, the, that high voltage was just too close to that metal plate. And so when he would be standing as an, and acting kind of like a ground, it was a floating supply, and he would reach out to touch it, 10,000 volts would just boom, jump right across the, the, the space. You know, there, were, there was no conductor. It was, not, it was just that he provided an easier path to ground, and it would just launch at him and hit him. He said it, it hurt really bad. So like, I remember one of the knobs, it was actually a big piece of rubber hose. So it was like a piece of rubber hose, like almost a foot long. And you grab the rubber hose to turn the knob. And the rubber hose just fits snugly over the little knob, you know, but kept you that far away from it <laughs> with an insulator. So high voltages are dangerous because they arc, right? But, um, but they're, easy, they're easier to transmit long distances. So you know, that's why we oftentimes use these transformers. So that's the basics describing the ideal transformer. Right? We've already kind of talked a little bit about it. We're running a little short on time, so I'll just move ahead. But you know, knowing that turns ratio, whether you whether and oftentimes in an ideal transformer, you'll not be told the N1 and N2, the big N1, big N2. You're just told the turns ratio. Or you're just told that it's a, you know, one to five, or you're told that it's a 2,000 volts input, you know, 25 volts output or something like that. I'll just tell you what the voltage ratings are for in and out or something like that. And from those numbers, you can use those ratios to find everything else. One of the biggest applications, though, is to use ideal transformers as isolation transformers. Again, this idea, like that transformer that my, that my advisor was using, right, it allowed his power supply to be separate from the physical wiring of the building. And so it acted as a physical disconnect between the two, isolating his system from the power lines in themselves. All the power is transferred through the mutual inductance of those transformer coils. So that's really nice. It allows you to separate your AC supply from a rectifier which is really important when we want to build those little boxes we, we stick on the wall to power our computers because those little boxes have to turn that AC into DC. You guys will start to learn next year um, how, how to build like rectifiers and turn AC signals back into DC to get DC voltages for your computers and things like that. Um, however, we don't just want to try to rectify the whole AC signal because that would back up and cause us problems on the upstream. So we allow the AC current to just flow right through this loop. And then our right hand side over here, the rectifier, can turn that into DC and DC doesn't go back through the transformer. Because transformer is an inductor, there has to be a changing current or a changing voltage to get through. If it's a constant, it doesn't actually transfer anything because there's no changing magnetic field. So we can generate DC on this side without affecting the input. So it's a really handy little device that way. Um, so anyways, it's also we can use transformers to isolate between stages in an amplifier. Similarly, it acts in a way like a DC block. So if there is an AC with a DC offset in one stage of an amplifier, Right, like one op amp puts out an AC DC signal. The next stage can get just the AC by being coupled with the transformer. Again, the DC doesn't feed through to affect our other device. Transformers also, and this is one of their biggest um, other uses besides isolation, is that they and, and just pure step up, step down, is that they function as a matching device. So they allow us to match the impedances. Why do we care about that? Because we want to get the best power from any amplifier or power supply we have into our load, right? Maximum power transfer. We've talked about that a couple of different times. So if I have an amplifier, like in my car, and I'm driving speakers, and those speakers don't have the right impedance, then my amplifier is going to overheat. Either it's not going to give enough power, right, if my impedance of my speaker is too high, or if my impedance of my speaker is low, then too much power will be dissipated inside of the amplifier, and I might burn it out. So I can use a transformer, and it uses that impedance transformation, the reflected impedance, to create a different impedance. So 
it functions in much the same way, but because it's an ideal transformer, we don't have to worry about that omega squared m term at the top. We can just use the turns ratio. So a lot of your problems as you work through this chapter are going to ask you to do impedance reflection. It allows you to hook the right-hand side of this circuit directly into the left-hand side and eliminate the transformer altogether. This circuit on the right is equivalent to this circuit on the left. All we've done is we take the impedance of this right-hand loop, so do like feminine equivalent impedance, or that loop, find its complete, its total equivalent impedance, and then divide by n. If it's a 1 in the primary to an n in the secondary, divide by n squared. And that gives you the equivalent impedance that the primary side sees. And so then you can just plug those together. Right? So cut this out and wire that to that and this to this, and you get this equivalent circuit. Also, just be careful, sometimes the book will tell you it's a 3 to 1 ratio. Don't let that throw you off. What's a 3 to 1? It's a 1 to 0.33, right? So just get it back in the form. Find n. n is always defined as 1 to n. So if they give you a 2 to 5 or a 3 to 1, just divide by the left-hand side. They do that to avoid a fraction is all. Right? Divide by the left-hand side and find out n. And then you can use that to do reflected impedance. You can use that to find your step up, step down ratios, and all of that. Okay. Um, okay. There's one example. And again, we've talked a lot about the power distribution system, so I think you've got a pretty good handle on that now. And that should do it for us. All right. So as you start to investigate your transformers, again, you're a, you're trying to build an ideal transformer. Ultimately, the last step is to have so many windings that it acts like a real transformer. And I think you'll, you'll see when you have only a couple of windings, it doesn't behave right. Or when the coupling coefficient is poor because of how you've arranged things, it's not going to behave like an ideal transform. As you try to get high number of turns and k close to 1, it will become better and better and better. Yeah. Um, Look around. See what you can find. That's part of the fun of this project. Is it's, that way everybody's just a little different. So I, I, you know, and I know it can be tricky, but like I said, it can be as simple as a bar of metal, or you can take apart an existing transformer if you've got one. So think about that before you go home for Easter break as well. It's always, it may be nice, maybe you got something laying around the house, and you're like, hey, that would be an interesting core for my transformer. I'm gonna, let's, let's try that out. Okay. So again, once you start doing it, um, in the lab, I, I did also mention, try to keep it to relatively low powers. Um, I just don't want anybody shocking themselves, right? And if at any point you're not comfortable for any reason, with like what the voltages you're generating are, things like that, make sure Jamie, or, you know, Professor Cavallo, or myself, somebody's around or, or ask us a question. Just, you know, if you're like, I'm not sure, am I going to generate 10,000 volts on this? We don't want you to fry yourself from a foot away, right? So, again, keep the currents low. Don't try to plug it straight into the wall. That, that's way too much power. So you can use a function generator. You know, some of the function generators aren't really super strong. But we also have some variacs available, although I know one of them, the fuse burned out. So I'll try to get Professor Kavala to fix that, hopefully, by this weekend. Uh, so when you get back, you can work on it. But that can scale down the voltage coming out of the power, out of the wall. So you can, instead of 120 volts, you can get 10 volts out. And, you know, not kill yourselves. Please, don't kill yourselves. Any of you kill yourselves? I'm going to be really upset. Really upset. Do you have any idea how much paperwork that would cause? <laughs> it would be horrendous. I blew myself up one time. Not as bad as Jeremy Hogan, but I got I just got sent to the hospital one time working in the lab. It was six months worth of paperwork that that cost me. Set my project back like a year because of getting sent to the hospital, blowing it up. It wasn't. Really, it was my fault, but it wasn't my. Fault. It wasn't complete negligence on my part, but you know, so please don't fry yourselves or kill yourselves. The president of the university would definitely be calling me, and that would not be a good conversation to have. And your parents, oh my gosh. <laughs> so just be careful. Keep it very, very reasonable. All right. Go have fun.